Blanca, thank you so much for touching on that. I think the big thing here is educating our patients on what to expect and some prophylactic proactive approaches that we can do on our end. You know, be it in breast cancer trials or here in lung cancer, dry eyes and mucositis are the two common ones with dato DXD, but thankfully majority are low grade. Whereas when it comes to ILD, thankfully it's not common. But that is where I started off with the story of TDXD as well. We've seen that DirectD can causing ILD, so this should definitely be on our radar. Sarah, given dry eyes and keratitis, can you touch how prevalent this is with Dato DXD and importantly, clinical pearls around this? Out in the community, what should I start to look out for? What can I do to help with this? So that's a, a really important point, right? So um, dry eye and keratitis is a side effect or a, a, a something to keep in mind, but it's about um, 35 to 40% of patients um, will ultimately develop some form of dry eye. Um, and those patients, really, when you look at the severity, it's more in the milder forms of dry eyes. So it's some irritation, some blurry vision, um, some changes that we can see on a slit lamp exam. Um, but that goes back to what Blanca was saying with education and and um, treating them before it becomes a problem with the artificial tears. And I strongly recommend preservative free artificial tears, regular eye exams, both so that we we can educate them in addition to um, the oncologists or the oncology team. But the recommendation is for a baseline eye exam or, or at earlier on in the, in the treatment course. Um, and the idea there, what I like about that is that I know what they have going into this, right? So a lot of these patients have baseline dry eye, um, either from previous chemotherapy or a lot of people in the population have dry eye. Um, so it's nice to know where they're starting. You also can have cataracts and that can make your vision change, obviously, and decrease. Knowing what due to the therapy and what's due to um, just an underlying uh, eye problems is really helpful. Sarah, thanks so much for educating our community with regards to that. Uh, Rahul, I have to agree that we are a little more comfortable when it comes to managing mucositis or nausea, but when it comes to ocular toxicity, we do get nervous, but thankfully what we are seeing here, majority of the side effects are low-grade dry eyes, which can be handled with artificial eyes, uh, as Sarah, you and Blanca mentioned. Erin, uh, Blanca also talked about mucositis with rinse and being a bit more proactive. Any clinical pearls around that, like that is, do you start these prophylactically before even these mouth sores or mucositis happens? And also touching on the ILD, because we have been a bit more fearful when it comes to TDXD, and that's what has caused uh, some fear there. How about ILD here? It's certainly a rare complication, but what's the incidence? How like, can we re-challenge our dose reduction? Yeah, so those are two great questions. I'll take them uh, one at a time. So in terms of the mucositis, um, I think what you indicated is the way we've been practicing most recently in terms of the prophylactic mouthwashes. So what I've typically done for my patients is I've provided them with two mouth rinses. One is a steroid containing mouth rinse uh, that we believe will decrease the incidence and severity of mucositis as the patient begins and continues on therapy, hopefully for a long duration with clinical benefit. And the second is a symptomatic mouth rinse, like a BLM mouth rinse or a mouth rinse that has multiple components that can help uh, with their toxicity. I like to provide those to the patients on day one. As Blanca already mentioned, it's very important to emphasize good oral hygiene and all of those uh, things. I'll do that even before I start therapy so we can get the, the patient thinking about what can go into that. Once a patient starts therapy, um, you know, outcomes uh, vary. We've seen many patients without any mucositis and we've some, seen some uh, severe cases, um, you know, depending on the severity, um, as the toxicity gets uh, above a grade one, I say a grade two or above, we need to be very careful with, um, you know, how we're managing the patient moving forward. Oftentimes, if the mucositis remains around a grade two, which is, you know, symptomatic and potentially leading to changes in oral intake or, or the type of diet a patient's taking on, if they're at that time point, you know, at the next scheduled infusion time, I've typically talked with patients, but I've delayed therapy at that time. I think that extra week or maybe even two weeks can be very effective at helping those patients really resolve their toxicity. And then when you go back into the therapy, not needing a dose reduction usually at that time point, you're now starting from a good baseline rather than a baseline that's already diminished. And that's where you kind of can avoid some of the toxicity. 
If you move in that direction and the patient does again develop, you know, grade two or higher toxicity and again re uh, requires a potential dose delay, that's when I'd start thinking about a dose reduction or if the mucositis becomes grade three. You know, again, Blanc and I have been uh, treating patients with Dato DXT across uh, the spectrum of advanced solid tumor since 2018, 2019. So we've seen a lot of patients on these therapies for a long time. Many of the patients who are on for several years do require dose delay and dose reduction at some time point. But I think what we've most importantly seen clinically is we have not seen a correlation between those delay or reductions and loss of tumor control. So certainly there's additional data we need to generate there to support what I'm uh, kind of saying circumstantially. You know, we've treated more than 80 patients that you see with this therapy. So we do have a, a large number of patients, but certainly that is dwarfed by the number of patients getting this drug every day now. Uh, but again, you know, anytime we make a dose delay or a dose reduction, there is a theoretical risk that we'll lose tumor control. That's not what we've seen. And I hope that getting that message out to patients or providers can diminish the fear associated with that. I, you know, we don't move to those maneuvers easily or quickly, but when required, I think that can really improve a patient's clinical course and uh, continue to allow them to uh, derive clinical benefit. Again, fears on this drug. Um, and then, you know, patients at that duration, there often is a time part where you need to do some of these maneuvers and they've continued to benefit from many years in many, in many of those cases. So that's how I address mucositis. The second um, aspect of your question was ILD. So, right. you know, as we've discussed, TDXD has, you know, the same uh, toxicity. We're seeing that across tumor types, same linker, same payload. I would also invoke the uh, experience with immunotherapy here. We've become very familiar with what ILD is um, and how to manage it. I would say the presentation and the management is nearly identical, at least to date, uh, in terms of what we've done with the ADC space. Certainly there's additional preclinical and translational work that probably should be done to help us understand the mechanism of action better. But again, in my experience and based on the, uh, the data that's been generated so far, it looks very similar to what we see with immunotherapy. I think that what Blanca said is spot on, uh, which is not surprising, uh, which that basically, you know, as patients are potentially developing respiratory symptoms, we really need to think about that. In our lung cancer patients, that's not uncommon. Many of them have underlying lung conditions. We need to thinking about that. Is that disease progression or are we having some concern about LD and getting uh, kind of intervening as quickly as possible. In my experience in the patients that have had ILD and you asked about incidents, I would say the incidence is probably around five to 10% of patients. So again, a very limited number and typically low grade. My experience has been with really um, aggressive monitoring, which we did on the clinical trial, you know, imaging every six weeks in many cases, we will see subtle changes on some patient scare scans. And if we see those subtle changes, you know, new ground glass opacities or changes potentially consistent with infectious or inflammatory conditions, which we often see on our scans, um, I've, uh, we've practiced very defensively. So anytime something like that has been seen on a scan, I've referred to you know uh, my pulmonary colleagues and I've identified and created a really strong relationship with an, a unique individual who sees all my patients. I think that's been very helpful. I know in the community, uh, you know, relationships are critical, but I think that having the same person see all of your patients allows for some longitudinal context and really good discussion. And anytime the pulmonary doctor has felt like there was some concern for ILD, not convinced of ILD, but the inability to rule it out, we've intervened very aggressively. So we've intervened with high dose steroids, but, um, you know, companion antibiotics to assure uh, no opportunistic infections. And I think as part of your question, you asked about rechallenge. Um, in many cases, we've been able to, even in the context of clinical trials with very stringent requirements in terms of our timelines, we've been able to resolve these radiographic only changes and per protocol, we're able to rechallenge with the drug. We've done that several times and we have not seen recurrence of ILD. So certainly something we need to take seriously, certainly something that we do, you know, there have been fatal events from ILD. So in no way, shape or form should we be taking this lightly. But I think that, you know, if it's low grade on the imaging studies, it resolves quickly with steroids. You know, the the experience in a limited number of patients in the clinical trial setting does suggest that rechallenge is safe and can be effective. Those patients oftentimes continue to benefit. And in, again, in my experience in several patients, I have not seen recurrence of ILD, although certainly I've watched them like a hawk and, and made sure that my pulmonary colleague was involved moving forward.